Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Yes, we are in here feeling better. It's a beautiful day. It's going to be blessed. Y'all ready? Good morning, good morning, good morning. <clears throat> yes, God. So this morning, put it down I can't do anything with these nails, y'all. I'm just going to pause it. So this morning, God woke me up. I was just up through all out the night. Like one, couldn't go to sleep. I was up at three. I was up at four. I was up every hour. And I was like, God, what are you? Like, what do, what do you need? What do you need? Because your girl trying to sleep. But, um. He kept saying the mud, the mud. And I was like, the mud. And then I remember I was outside making mud pies and I was believing God for rainbows. Indeed, I went outside, heard his instructions and I was in the dirt making mud pies like I did when I was a little girl. And then I had the double rainbow up here and I you know, showed everybody the double rainbow because he said mud pies and rainbows. But I left it like that because I really didn't understand the significance of what he wanted when he told me to make mud pies. I was like, Okay. I really didn't understand it. So I did it and I left it as that. But all last night, he just kept saying the mud, the mud. And I'm like, I don't understand. So this morning I got up and he led me to Genesis. And I said, I understand now. I understand now. I got it. So, um, <laughs> so, um, this morning he had me titled this the mud. So then there's a couple things that he wanted me to define for you guys, which was mud itself and um, what actually happens when you get mud and the importance of mud and the importance of actual dust. So it says mud has been around for centuries. Humans have used it as a con um, as construction material um, and healing for religious purification rituals and a form of recreation. Things that are made out of mud are fire stones, floor tiles, pots, toys, etc. So all of these things can be mud out of uh, made out of simple dirt and water. Dirt and water. Those things, dirt and water, the ingredients can make a lot of things with the right hands. And I was like, okay. And then he said, from nothing to something. From nothing to something. God is about to take the nothing and bring it into something. And I was sitting back and I was like, okay. And then he had me in Genesis. And then he said, I need you to define what dust is. And he says, um, what is the importance of dust? And it says the importance of dust. Um, hence, if we, if there were no dust in the air, escaping steam would remain visible. There would be no clouds in the sky and no vapor in the atmosphere constantly accumulating through the evaporation of seas and oceans from the earth's surface would have to find some other means of returning to its source so without just the simple dust that we see and don't see that we wipe up every single day without it there is no um there would be um I'm sorry, there would be no dust in the air. Escaping steam would remain visible. So we would be able to see steam all the time. There would be no clouds in the sky. Can you imagine a world with no clouds in the sky? And it says, and the vapor of the atmosphere constantly accumulate in through evaporation from the seas and the ocean from the earth's surface. And that's what God was saying. And I was like, okay, okay. So dust that we clean up all the time, dust that we just get around, get a little dust buster and we just get and get in our car and we just wipe it down. It actually has a purpose. The dust has purpose. The um, mud has purpose. And I was like, okay, God, dust, dust, dirt. Okay, where are we going? Where are we going? So then he had me open up my Bible to Genesis 2. Genesis 2, and he had me sit there with it. And it says, Genesis 2 and 7. 
And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the air and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living thing. Let me read that again. Because what were we created from? What were we created from? 2 and 7 Genesis. And the Lord God formed man of dust of the ground and breathed life into his nostrils, the breath of um, life, and man became a living thing. See, we have this saying that we, um, in the struggle, that we got it from the bottom. Like we started from the bottom. But where is your bottom? In Genesis 2, verse 7, the bottom is dust. The very thing that we wipe up every single day. The very thing that nobody even pays attention to. The very thing that we try to wipe away because we don't want anybody to see the dust. And some people might have allergies to dust. But how can you be allergic to what you're from? Listen, God is saying that he's taking the nothing and turn it into something. You might be a nobody to a lot of people, but to God, you're everything. He took his time with the dust, with the thing that we walk on every single day, the things that we put our shoes on every single day so our feet won't get dirty. But we come from that. We come from the dirt. We come from the bottom. I mean, social status with money might make you think you come from higher up, but we all come from the bottom. And God is literally about to take the no names and turn them into something great because you started from the bottom and yeah, you're about to be here. See, they don't understand when you were in the bottom, you were praying more. Have you ever been in a situation where everyone's counting you out, but you know who God is, you know who God is and you know that he's not going to fail you? And you need everybody to sit around and doubt you. You need them to put pressure on you. You need them to say that you can't make it anyway. You need them to do that. I begin to thank people when they tell me I can't do something. I begin to laugh in the face of them because I know that what you say I can't, God says I can. And I begin to pray more. I begin to fast more. I begin to sit with God more. And I start telling God, they say, I can't do this, but I know you said I can. God, the devil say, I can't do this, but God, I know I can. God, let's prove them wrong, God. Let's prove them wrong. Everything that they said that we could not do, God, let's do it and add tax to it, God. Since they counted us out, because counting me out is counting God out. And since they're counting us out, God, let's show them. Let's show them that our light shines. Let's show them that you will bring wise men to the star to locate that star. The star would be shining so bright that the wise men would have to follow that star. And when they get to that star, they're going to see that we're made in your image. And they're going to have to gift us and they're going to have to bless us again. God will make your light shine so bright that people will have to come and see where it's from. Even people that talk so badly about you, even people that abandoned you, they're going to spin the block and that's the word God kept giving me all yesterday. And that's my favorite word, spinning the block. And I was like, God, who finna get the block spent on them? Who finna, who finna have to come back? And he says, everybody that's doubted you, everybody that's doubted you, they're about to have to come look at God's children again. They're about to look at you again. They say you wasn't nothing. They say you th that you're a product of your environment. They say that you're like your mother and like your father and like everybody else that came before but you're not. You're actually the one that's in the wilderness battling against the generational curses. You're the one that's standing up to the devil and saying that it stops with me, that you can't have me anymore, that you can't have my children anymore, that you can't have my children's children anymore. It stops with me. Do you know that generational curses are familiar? Familiar spirits that passed on from generation to generation to the generation to your ancestors before you, they couldn't defeat it. And some of them, it wasn't that they couldn't defeat it. They were afraid to defeat it. So they came up with all these survival techniques. And some of us are living out of survival mode because of fear that was instilled into their parents and their parents and their parents' parents. 
So the way they living right now is because they're still in survival mode, thinking that something's going to hurt them. So they have these defense mechanisms, which is survival techniques, which won't let them change their mind. But if you can ever change your mind, you can change your life. Survival isn't a thing when you walk with God because he's already there. He's defeating the demons for you. You don't got to defeat them. All you got to do is walk up in the The battle is already yours. But if you got this mindset and this struggle mentality and this defense mentality, you're going to always think that everything is out to get you, get you, get you, get you, get you. When God sends good people into your life, you're going to sabotage it because you think that they're out to get you because you haven't broke off that generational curse because you haven't healed correctly and hurt people hurt people. So everyone that comes into your life, you end up hurting them and burning bridges and everybody knows your reputation. Now, no, nobody wants to deal with you no more because you are a bridge burner. When some people were put into your life to help you, to heal you, to love you back to life, but you're so scared because the last person hurt you and the last person and the last person hurt you. So now you're thinking that everyone that comes along is going to hurt you. That's not the case. God says, I, in fact, sent them in to heal you. But you're so hurt right now and you're so broken right now that you can't see the goodness that I'm putting in your life. God is saying, I need you to go back and heal those broken places. And I need you to go back to the familiar spirits that are looming in your family and let them know that you're not coming to be familiar with them anymore. You're coming to break that off. You're not dancing with the devil anymore. You're not dancing with the devil anymore. And you're not hiding from the devil anymore. The devil has no power over you. The devil has no power over you at all. Those familiar spirits in your family that's been looming, looking like family, familiar, family, familiar, family. Sounds almost the same. Looks almost the same on paper. But it's not anymore when it comes to you. Sometimes you got to cut family off too to heal yourself. Sometimes they can be more toxic than anybody else. But you got to do what you got to do for you to get this generational curse broke off of you. They'll come back once they see the goodness of God. They'll come back. But right now it's unhealthy for you to be in those kind of situations. Right now it's not healthy for you. And I remember people used to be like, oh, but that's your cousin. Oh, but that's your uncle. Oh, but that's your auntie. Oh, but they're still having the generational curse on them and they're still covering up the nastiness that happened, the molestation, the rape, the abuse. They're still covering up all of these things. So, yeah, they are, but they're not in the operating in the right spirit right now. So until they get broken free from those spirits, that might just be my cousin. That might just be my auntie. That might just be my uncle. But they're operating out of a generational curse. So until they get healed, I got to go. It doesn't mean that my love for them changes. It means the way that I operate with them changes. I still love you, but I love me more. But I love me more. So I got to heal me and get away from everything toxic. Otherwise, it'll take me down and I'll be in that same spirit, operating out of that same spirit, mad at the world, fighting the world, waking up angry all the time. Because I'm dealing with these things that I'm making friends with the familiar spirits. I'm making friends with the enemies. I'm making friends with the curses. I'm making friends with the curses. And I'm not coming here to make friends with the curses. I'm coming here to defeat them. The curses are not my friends. The generational curses are not my friends. No. Your secrets are not my secrets. Mm Mm-mm. I don't come here to play with your secrets. I don't come here to play with your curses. I come to defeat them. See, the curses are so familiar and so frequent that they think that I'm going to be one of y'all because ain't none of y'all defeated them. Ain't none of y'all defeated them yet. So when they see somebody like me come in with that anointing or someone with you like you come in with that anointing, they think you coming to play with them too. We ain't coming to play with you. We ain't coming to play with you. For centuries, you were allowed to roam in the family. For centuries, you were allowed to come in and do the stanky leg and tiptoe around the family. For centuries, you were allowed to eat at the table after you literally went in there and abused a little baby last night. Come in fresh like them, smelling just like them. 
You are allowed to do that. But it stops with me. Because I'm not coming to make friends with you and make you a plate at the table. I come to eat in the presence of you after I destroy you. I'm not playing with nobody's demons. I'm not playing with nobody's demons. And it stops with me. A simple thing as not letting your kids sit on someone's lap breaks a curse. Not letting a child hug somebody they don't want to hug stops a curse. Not letting your child spend a night at everybody's house because everybody's house has a different nighttime agenda. Not making your child go with people they say they don't want to go with. That stops right there. Not sending your child unsupervised into a public restroom. It stops right there. All of these things can break off curses. Because for centuries, we send our kids to spend a night at somebody's house and they have the kids that has been hypersexualized begin to molest them. They play in the closet. I know about all of these because I know I've been there. The uncles try to molest them. The stepdaddies try to molest them. The daddies of the children molest them. You don't belong to them. You do grown things at other people's house and they mamas, they really don't care. Sometimes the mamas and the sisters, the men molesting them too. You don't know what happens in somebody's house at nighttime. You don't know what happens. So it has to stop here. And you're sending your child into a public restroom and just letting them go while you're shopping in a store. You don't know who's in that restroom. You don't know who's in that restroom waiting for your baby. And you ain't there to stop it. It can happen just like that in the blink of an eye. In the blink of an eye. You got to think about it. You got to think about it. And if your child don't want to go with somebody, don't force them to go with them because you don't understand. Your child don't know how to tell you that they're doing something to them, but you're pushing them over there because you need some me time. And I understand. I'm a mother of four. I had five in my house up until last year. I'm about to have five again. You don't understand why they're telling you no. And some of them can't voice it. But listen to your child the first time. And you won't have to go through years of therapy later on in life. And years of them laying with strange men and doing all of these things. Years of them battling their sexuality because you're not ready to have those hard conversations. And because you were careless, thinking carelessly. Not thinking that these people are going to do something to your child because you wouldn't. And you let them go. And now they're coming back with all these demons on them that weren't theirs. Now they're on, on the website searching for porn because they had somebody little phone and their mama don't got monitoring on their phone and their screen time. And now they're looking through all of this stuff because their mama is a little loose and lax in their parenting. But you're not. You have to think about all of these things when we say we're going to be generational curse breakers. In order to do that, we have to start parenting our ch children to be broken from those curses as well. We have to be conscientious of everything that is happening around us and our surroundings. And that little sit on uncle's lap can have a little feel good for a moment for the uncle, but a lifetime of scarring for that child. You have to think about it. It might seem simple, but it's not. And the people that have a problem with you saying no and boundaries for your child are the ones that you need to be watching in the first place. If I tell you that my child not finna sit on your lap and you get mad and say, I ain't one of them, you the problem. Because I said no about my child and I meant no. I meant no. And if you got a problem with my child not sitting on your grown behind lap, then you're the problem. You got to start paying attention to all of these things. See, we always want to scream out that we're generational curse breakers. But what are we breaking? We can go back and we can confront them. And yes, we're breaking some chains. But if we're sending our child back to those places, we're not breaking anything. Whenever I think about like uh, you see these shows where these women, they were abused, they were abused. And then they had these kids and they send them back. Oh, they with my mama. Well, who abused you? Oh, my mama. Oh, but she not going to abuse them. Girl, what? Are you serious? You sent your child back to the person that abused you, back to the person that covered up Big Johnny them raping you. You sent your child back. How do you sleep at night knowing that you sent your child back to bondage? You sent your child back to bondage. 
You know that the way you're on drugs right now and the way you out here in these streets right now, being a 304 girl or whatever you want to be, is the reason because that house and you out here out of your mind. But it's because of everything that happened in that house. But you rationalize it in your mind to say, I'm going to send my child back there. I'm going to send my child back there. Baby, I don't care me and my kids are sleeping under a bridge in the alley. We're going to be together before I send my child back to a house that's literally got me out here out of my mind, selling my body, doping my body up, laying with all these men. There ain't no way that I'm sending my child back to a house of horrors and sleeping good at night. We have to start breaking the curses. We have to start breaking them, not putting a bandage over it, but legitly breaking them. And I know that's not even where I was going, but I guess God really wanted me here as well, because maybe somebody on here needs to hear about this. In order to break it, we need to break it completely, not halfway, not slap a bandage on it, but break it completely. And if it means isolating you and your children from these family members that ain't family, you mean to tell me when you get to your mama house and your, your mama cuss you out like a dirty dog and your mama been jealous of you your whole life and you bring your kids around here. Now your kids are seeing your mama cussing you slap out like a dog running at you, trying to fight you. Now your kids see this level of toxicity, but you're trying to bring your kids out of that. But you bring your kids back to the house that does this. You're not breaking it. You're exposing them to the curse again. Sometimes you need to separate yourself from that. They're not supposed to see that level of toxicity. You mean to tell me your daddy been beating you down your whole life and now you want your daddy to babysit your children? And now your kids coming home talking about granddaddy done cussed me out, granddaddy done tried to fight me, but you know because that's what he did to you. But you send your kids over there? Ain't no way. Ain't no way. You are their mother. You are their father. You're supposed to protect them. And although they did not protect you, you are made to be the generational curse breaker. So you got to protect them like you wanted to be protected. Remember those cries you used to do? Remember those prayers to God you used to do? Remember if you say, God, if you just get me out of this? Remember how God came and got you out? Even if it was in your adult life, why are you taking your children back? And now they seeing you getting disrespected over and over again. But they not raised like that, so they really don't understand. It's not computing. You got to break it. I don't care that they're your mama right now. They not healed right now. Start praying for them. Start fasting for them. Have a conversation. If the conversation don't go, baby, listen, a little bit of truth always gets into somebody always gets into somebody whether they like it or not but you don't take your kids around places like that you don't raise your kids like that i'm not the guru of being a mother i felt in a lot of areas in my life especially there's no no right way or wrong way there's no guide there's no nothing all i know is i can't bring my kids back it's a reason why my children have never met my dad. My dad was my molester. My dad was my abuser. My dad was all of these things. My dad has tried to come see them. He's tried to come to my job. He's tried to come to my sister's house. He's tried to come see them. But I will never have you around my children, ever. I know what you did to me. I'm not going to play with you. I'm not going to play these games with you. You will never, ever see them. You will never, ever touch them with the hands that did what it did to me. You will never, ever, ever see them. And I mean that to the day I die. I don't care if they have to be shipped off to CPS. You will never, ever, ever see them. Ever. And I mean that with every breath in my body. I remember the days I cried and prayed for you to go somewhere. I remember I cried and prayed to talk to God and lightning struck your trailer and burnt it to the ground. God hears your prayers. You will never see my children ever you got to have that mindset and people was like you don't be saying in my adult life these grown adults come in here and they say why you don't never bring your kids out there to see your daddy oh you got time because i got time 
Oh, I remember him doing that. I don't care what you remember. I don't care what you remember. My truth don't matter about your truth. My truth is my truth, and I stand on it. I remember my dad telling me about a, what, four years ago, I'm the meanest child that he's ever had. No, I'm the child that stands up to you because it stops with me. It stops with me. I'm not coming out here having barbecues with you. I'm not coming out here having tea with y'all. I'm not coming out here being friends with the demons that terrified me at night. I'm not coming out here with the man that was supposed to protect me, but actually abuse me. The one that was supposed to teach me how to be a woman and how to date and never did. It taught me how to be beat down by men, raped by men. I'm not coming out here to make friends with you. I'm coming out here to defeat the curses and let you know that you would never, ever see my children. Ever. You don't know their names. You don't know their ages. And I meant that. And I stand on it. Don't play with my children. I go six feet under for mine. And I mean that. Because you won't ever put your hands on my children. They won't know what it is to have somebody bigger than them on them, holding them down, praying for them to get off and finish. They won't know what that is like. Because it stops with me. It stops with me. Back to the text, y'all. I don't know why God had me over there. But he had me over there because maybe somebody needed to get that. Somebody needs to understand that. It stops with you. It stops with you. And I call them all out by name now because I'm not afraid. And if they want to sue me, all right. It's the agitation. It's, it's still there. I can still do what I need to do. Do what you need to do. I'm calling out names. I'm putting names with faces because the demons can no longer lurk and, and have me afraid and terrified and jumping in my sleep. When I first got with my fiance, I used to jump in my sleep all the time. I used to jump in my sleep because I didn't know if someone would ever come in there and do something to me again. I sleep with my room door locked even as an adult because I don't know if someone's going to come in there and try to do something to me. But all of that breaks off. It stops with me. It stops with me. My children are not going to have to endure that. And we're going to have those tough conversations. You can't hurt mama's feelings by talking to me and telling me what someone did to you. You're not going to hurt mama's feelings. And if they told you that they're going to do something to me, let them know that my mama is a thug. She ready. She bought that life. So you can't do nothing to her. The lies that people tell to make children afraid, saying that they're going to hurt your mom, saying they're going to hurt your dad. Try it. Try it. We come from the bottom. We come from the bottom. God is saying that you're coming out of the struggle. You're coming out of the struggle. He keeps talking to me about a worldwide name. He keeps talking about the light and the stars and gold flakes. I had this beautiful woman send me this letter and um, I want to make sure I get her name correctly. It's Kelly Mazzani, M-A-Z-Z-O-N-I. And she sent this to me and she said, sealed with gold. And it's a lovely letter. It's very long and it's a lovely letter. And the fact that she said sealed with gold and God's been showing me gold flakes coming from the sky. I opened it and I instantly began laughing because God does confirmation everywhere. So when I opened up the letter and it said sealed with gold, I began to instantly start laughing because I've been seeing gold flakes sprinkling like a congratulations or like confetti. And God is saying that you have made it. Some of you guys have been fighting these curses and you have been winning. You've been fighting these curses and you've been winning. I recently came across a post um, and I had to comment on it because it touched my soul. And he was like, he was learning how to read it. If you're on TikTok, I think you've seen it. He was learning how to read again and he was frustrated with himself, but he kept pushing himself. I think he was reading Charlotte's Web and he was like, I supposed to know this. He was being a little hard on himself, but I had to write on the day. If you need me to show you how to read it, it'll be my honor. But it's going back to the things that we avoided and we go back and we start fixing them 
If we didn't know how to do something, we start teaching ourselves little by little, piece by piece, and we start learning again. I was telling my fiance the other night, I said, I don't know how to do this soft girl era because I, my mom always had two jobs and she went to school. So I had to raise my brothers and I had to take them to school and I had to cook and I had to clean. And I've been raising kids since I had before I can even have kids and I've been surviving. And I had to take care of myself and I was a stripper and I was this and I was a model here. And I just always, 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 always had to make it. So I don't know how to be in that soft girl era. So I sound kind of rough when I'm talking on the phone and it's hard for me to tell you that I love you and it's hard for me to say these things and I do love you, but it's, it sounds simp if I come over and I just be like, oh, I love you today. I don't know how to, I don't know how to have that mushy side. I don't know how to convert. So I'm on the phone and I'm telling him like, hey, hey, I, I miss you. And he was like, what? I was like, yeah, I miss you. He was like, okay, I like that. I like that. And I'm like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to be vulnerable because I had to be so hard and I had to survive. And it's the little things. It's the little things that have to transition in my head. And he knows that I love him. I gave him all these children <laughs> and he knows that I'm always going to be there for him. And he knows that I got his back and people call us Bunny and Clyde and, and what is it? Slim and all whatever, because, you know, we both from the streets and we're both trying to convert. And it's hard because I always got his back and he always got my back. But we need to learn how to love correctly. And it's going to be a hard dance. Because we're both so strong and we're both strong minded. And everybody that's from here already know our story. Like it's, it's very strong, but we have to learn to love each other differently. And, you know, he said something to me the other day and it hurt my feelings. And normally I argue with him. And I said, you know what? You hurt my feelings. And he was like, what? I said, what you said to me hurt my feelings and I didn't appreciate it. And he was like, oh, I apologize. I didn't know that hurt your feelings. I said, yeah, it did. It hurt my feelings. And instead of me taking the the hurt and spewing out, I normally, that's what I would normally do. I said, no, it hurt me. It hurt me. I'm learning how to use different verbiage for different things. And it might sound like, oh, you're 37. You're supposed to know this. I'm 37. I'm from the dirt projects in the 80s, molested, raped, abused. All I know is survival. So it's a process. It's a slow process. But as he say, we got our whole life to get this together. We got our whole life to get this together. And he's right. So anyway, God is saying that he's taking the struggle. He's taking the struggle and he's turning to get around. I don't know why that made me emotional, <laughs> but it did. Um, yeah. God is saying that he's about to give it to you from the mud. He's about to give it to you from the mud. And people think that mud has no purpose. When in fact, yes. When in fact, mud has several purposes. I want to say mud makes concrete, if I'm correct. I don't know where my constructions work is at. Your girl out here making it. <laughs> I think so, correct? Um, But mud has purposes. It can help build houses. It can build huts. It can do all of these things. Yes, the mud pies. Mud has a lot concrete as sand. Sand is mud. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Because <laughs> your girl over here struggling. <laughs> um, cement is water, rock. What did you say it was? Cement is water, rock. It's concrete. Okay, thank you. Yes, but God is saying he's taking that and he's about to build a great foundation. Mud is healing. Yes. Thank y'all. Break it down for me. <laughs> They call concrete mud because it looks looks like it. Oh, pressure make diamonds. Correct. Correct. TikTok on it right now, y'all. <laughs> yes. Mud is the foundation. God has given us mud can make bricks. Yes. <laughs> and we're going to be rooted on it. Mud houses. Mud pressure makes diamonds. All of these things. You see how you guys know what I really don't know? The purposes of mud. And I need you to walk around for that. 
Mud is the clay that potters in the potter's hand. Yes, water cuts diamonds. And God is saying that it has many different purposes. And so does you. And so does you. You can't see a star unless it's in the dark. That's my favorite thing. That's my favorite saying. It has to be dark in order for the light to shine. So don't get afraid of your dark times. Know that you are the light. That's why I had to get dark so the world can see you. You had to be in that dark place so the wise men can find that light. Jars of clay. You know, I had saw a video and this lady, she had this little piece of, um, this little piece of clay and she had it on the potter's wheel. She put her hand in it and she made this big vase out of this little bit of clay, this little lump of clay. She made this huge vase. And I was just so fascinated that she put this clay on the potter's wheel. And it started out little, I'm talking about little. And she began to put water on it and she spent it and she shaped it and she formed it and she molded it. And it, little by little, it became so big. It became so big and it became this big vase. And she took it off and she put heat to it and it made this beautiful vase. God is saying he is the potter and we are the clay. And it's crazy that he uses that terminology when we were made from dust. We were made from dust and the air of God's lungs. He breathed the breath of life into you. We look like our father because he single-handedly created us. And I love the part where he says in Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and of the cattle and, um, and over all of the earth and over every creepy thing that crawls. Do you know that we are afraid of spiders? Do you know that we are afraid of a cricket, but we have dominion over every creeping thing? We're afraid of the thing that we actually have dominion over. And I'm, I'm just such a big advocate for not cutting yourself because the doctors want to make you in their image, but God has already made you in his image. The doctor's trying to be something that he isn't, which is God. And God is saying, I made you in my own image and my own likeness. Do you know that you look just like your father with all of your imperfections and they're only imperfections because you're looking at something that is is um photo edited and shot and chopped so you think that nobody's supposed to have a blemish you think that nobody's supposed to have a role you think that nobody's supposed to have no, you know bad skin or or whatever so you're looking at this ideal image of something that isn't correct it isn't true they edited it they photoshopped it they filtered it and they presented it to you as the beauty standard well who told them that their beauty standard is correct who told them that their beauty standard was correct? Because the way I was born was in God's image and his likeness. But you're telling me that I don't have the beauty that you perceive that I'm supposed to have? And who told you that you were beautiful? Who told you that? Because you filtered yourself out? I think that you're broken. I think that you're unhealed. So much so that you have to filter out the truth. You have to filter out who you are. You have to inject who you perceive that you want to be. And you're so insecure and you're trying to put those insecurities on other people to make it your norm when it's abnormal for you to be that way. But you use your social status to come and say, this is the way. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. You're insecure and need to heal. And you're leading people astray. And you're having the BBLs and you're having the tummy tucks and you're having the injections and you're having the fillers and you're saying this is the way. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. That's the unhealed way. It's always people that are living in their truth and their natural self and people say, ew, you're hairy. Ew, your hair texture isn't right. I got, I got 2C. I got 3C. I got the hair that's coming out of my head that God gave me. Whether you like it or not, whether it's good texture according to you or not, my skin is the way it is without bleaching. Whether you like it or not, stop bleaching your skin, you're beautiful. Stop bleaching your skin. Your color of black is beautiful. 
Stop looking at them posters telling you to bleach something that God didn't tell you to bleach in the first place. Your skin is gorgeous. Stop listening to these people telling you that you're not beautiful. Your shade of skin is beautiful. Your texture of hair, whether it's thin, whether it's thick, whether it's coily, whether it's straight, is beautiful. Stop listening to these people that have nothing inside to give them. They're broken and they need to heal. Do you know how much ridicule I face every day? Some days it can seem like a lot and I'll have breakdowns. And other days I have to remember that God made me in his image. Whether you like it or not, this is who God says I am. I will not conform to the socialites and, and, the, and the vanity people. I will not conform. I will not be transformed by you. This is who God says I am. And if God said it, who cares what man says? Now your thighs don't match your butt. Now your top don't match your bottom. Now your hair don't match this. Like, what are, what are we doing? Have we become so lost that we let unhealed people dictate where we're supposed to be in life? They're not healed. So now they're going to dictate the world? No, baby, go get healed. And then come back and you'll see that everyone is beautiful. Small, big, medium. It don't matter. Your size doesn't determine nothing. God ain't coming and said, oh, I'm going to pick you. You know, let me get to this. When Samuel had to go anoint a king, Samuel went looking for looks. He saw David's first brother and he said, oh, yeah, he looks the part. Yeah, he, he's, he's surely a king. He's strong in stature. He's tall. He's handsome. God said, no. He went to the next brother. Oh, yeah, surely he's a king. Broad shoulders. Good. Yep. God said, no. Went to the next brother. God says, no. On to the next brother. Surely he's a king. God said, no. When David came into the building, God said, yes, because he looked at David's heart. He was a man after God's image. He was a man after God's heart. God went for him because of his heart. You can look good with all the aesthetics you want, but that doesn't mean God is going to pick you. God is looking for your heart because he created us in his image and he's trying to see if we look just like what he created. He's coming to see if our heart matches his posture. That's what he's coming to see. Don't worry about having the latest and the greatest. God will make all of that stuff come to you. God will make the wealth, the notoriety, all of those things come. Continue to be a good person. Continue to be a good person. Helping the helpless, loving the ones that haven't been loved, speaking life into people, saying positive things over people's lives, not judging people for how they look or what they have, their social status, not getting on the World Wide Web, putting nasty comments under somebody that you don't even know page. You don't even know what someone's going through. So your one comment can push them over the edge. Had you not said these nasty, demeaning things over somebody that you don't even know, why would you do something like that? You need to be a woman of substance, a man of substance, spreading. If God says, be the salt of the earth, seizing them with good things. Make sure that the things that we're saying to people, that they're positive. You don't want to just because you can write something because it's your phone and you can do what you want. All of those things have repercussions. Everything we do in this life has repercussions. And we want to make sure that we're seasoning the world with good things. And although you can, doesn't mean you should. Just because you can talk about somebody. Just because you can leave a comment. Just because you can. It doesn't make it okay. People still have feelings. And your one comment could be the one comment to push somebody over the edge. And now you are single-handedly going to be responsible for their death. Because you could, remember? Make sure that we're speaking great things. God had me write this. 
And he said, it's time to surrender some things to him. Surrender to hand over the things that are too big for you. God, I surrender my burdens, the things that are too big, the things that are weighing me down to you. I surrender my job and the problems that come with that job, the people that don't like me, the people that lie and gospel on me, the people that want to send me to HR. I surrender my life, my house, my neighbors, my marriage. I surrender my finances because you are the way maker. You are the provider. God, I surrender it all. God, I surrender all of my social media platforms. I don't want anything for myself. All of you, God. God, I don't want it all. I want you to have it. I surrender my ministry. It is your ministry. I'm just here to be a vessel. I surrender everything over to you, God. God, I'm surrendering some things over to you because I want you to come in and I want you to do what you need to do in it. You have free will in this area of my life and I'm giving it over to you. So I'm going to leave it like that. I want you to know that you come from dust, which means you come from the bottom. And God is about to give you a firm foundation. I know I rambled here and there, so I hope that it made some sense to a lot of people. But God is just saying that you come from the bottom and he's about to show you how to get it from the mud. Now it makes sense when he told me mud pies and rainbows, mud pies and rainbows. You are about to get it from the mud and the rainbow is the promise because after you get it from the mud, he's about to put you on solid foundation and represent you to the world again and represent you to the world again. I love you all. I pray that you have a good day. <clears throat> Been a little bit better. Mississippi mud pies, Florida mud pies, wherever you from mud pies. You know, I would challenge y'all today. I would challenge y'all to make a mud pie today and tag me in that bad boy. But <laughs> if you don't want to, that's fine as well. But God has been challenging me with my child like mine. He had me in the dirt making mud pies. He had me at the playground running around like a child. He had me out there. And um, it's another challenge that he wants me to do that's a little bit more challenging. And I might break down after the video. And I haven't got the scrimp to do it just yet. But um. God is challenging you to have that childlike faith, and he's hoping that you would do it. So I just hope that you guys, um, yes, I hope you guys find that and just, you know, roll with it. But God is about to show up and show out. I played in the mud. Yes. You know, I have a picture of my second son. He was, he, I was in the house for a second getting his toy and I came back out and he was face first in the dirt and he was covered in it and he was eating it. He was everything. And I was like, boy. And he was just as happy as he could be with the mud and the dirt. And God is saying that even in your struggle, he's about to have you have peace in the storm, peace in the mud, peace in the dirt. God is about to give you peace that surpasses all understanding. And I pray abundance over your day. I pray that God restores the childlike faith in your life. The childlike faith in your life. Whatever you used to love to do as a child, I challenge you to do it again. I challenge you to do it again. Even if for a moment, even if our little knees can't stand it anymore, just do it again. Laugh again. Laugh at the things that used to make you laugh again. Because God is about to do something amazing for you. And that's my prayer over you today. That you will find your childlike faith again. And watch God do it for you again. Yes, we're going to twirl in October. And y'all going to see me try to dance. Y'all know I can't dance. <laughs> um, I love you all and have a wonderful day. What, baby? Love you. I'm done with you, baby. <laughs> All right. Y'all have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs>